نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان للنبي والذين آمنوا أن يستغفروا للمشركين ولو كانوا أولي قربى من بعد ما تبين لهم أنهم أصحاب الجحيم بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات وذكر الحكيم استغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المؤمنين واستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب يسر ولا تعسر وتم بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاح يا فتاح يا فتاح صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم الأمين Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Today I want to share with you some reflections from verse number 113 of Surah Tawbah Verse number 113 of Surah Tawbah I have chosen this ayah to illustrate a point It's a very common misconception and a very dangerous attitude towards reading the Quran We read the Quran without understanding the context or we read the translation of the Quran without understanding the context, without understanding why and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said something and we just jump on to conclusions or we conclude or derive something that we are not supposed to conclude or derive. <clears throat> Let me tell you the literal meaning of this translation and then inshallah you will get the idea that how can somebody can get a wrong idea. Let me tell you this literal translation of, of this, this, this ayah that I just recited to you. <clears throat> Listen to it carefully. It says, مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا It's not becoming of Prophet ﷺ and the community that believe. It's not suitable for Prophet ﷺ and all those people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Muslims of the time of Rasulullah ﷺ, what is not suitable for them? أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ That they seek forgiveness for all those people who commit shirk, who commit idolatry. All those people who commit shirk, the people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they should not be seeking forgiveness for all those people. Even if, you're, even if they are your close family members, even if they are your close relatives, they are close family members, you should not be seeking forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. Why? Why you should not be seeking forgiveness for them? مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ Ba'd iske, after it's been made clear to you that all these people are the people of the fire of Jahannam. After it's been made clear to you, after it's been made clear to them that they are the people of the fire of Jahannam. Now when you look at the literal translation of this ayat, if you just look at the translation without understanding the context, without understanding when these ayats were revealed or when this ayat was revealed, if you just look at the, the, the translation of this ayat, what are you going to say to yourself? What are you going to say to yourself? You're going to say to yourself, we are not supposed to make dua for any non-Muslim because they are the people of the fire of Jahannam. Ayah says it very, very clearly that all these people, it's been made clear to you that all these people who commit shirk, who commit idolatry, all of these people are going to go into the fire of Jahannam so you're not supposed to make dua for them. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. If only you look at the translation. Let me tell you the context and then you will understand the translation of this ayah. What is the context of this ayah? Now the context is that Prophet ﷺ, he was preaching to the same group of people in Mecca for how many years? For 13 years, for well over a decade. For over a decade in Mecca, he is teaching to the same group of people, he is preaching to the same group of people for 13 years now. And after he moved to Medina, he is still engaged with them. He is still giving them da'wat after he moved to Medina and then eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down this revelation eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closed the doors for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to make dua for them anymore so as a matter of fact for 13 years when he was in Mecca he was constantly making dua for them regularly all the time he was making dua for them and as a matter of fact all Anbiya Karam alayhi salatu wasalam from Adam alayhi salam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa all Anbiya Karam Ali Musalatu Wasalam, they prayed for their nations. They prayed for their people. Am I wrong? They prayed for their people. They even prayed for their worst enemies at the time of Dawah. When they were giving Dawah to the people, they were actually praying for the worst enemies. It is actually at the end of time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down a revelation and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah that no longer can you make dua for these people. 
for these specific people again not for all of them for these specific individuals for these specific people you cannot make dua anymore i have highlighted them to you as your enemies for example just take the case of abu lahab we all know who was abu lahab he was the uncle of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in that case he is actually qualifying the definition of walau kanu uli qurba uli qurba means the closest relatives so abu lahab was the closest relative he was the uncle of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and abu lahab he hated rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he despised rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he did whatever he can to harm rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam what what did prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam do to him back what did prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did to him did prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hate did prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hate him back did prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam make bad dua for him no prophet is still making dua for abu lahab he still inviting him towards haq he still calling him towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously he is making dua for abu lahab for his own uncle until the ayat came tabbat yada abi lahab wa da which basically says that abu lahab is condemned for eternity for eternity there is la'nat upon him he is condemned for eternity until these ayat came so what it means for all of us practically speaking what it means for all of us yes absolutely we are supposed to make dua for everyone if we are muslim and our family or our family is hindu or our family is christian or our family is jew or our family is atheist you know yes absolutely you are supposed to make dua for them you are supposed to make dua for them because it's not been made clear to you that their hearts are never going to change it's not been made clear to you that these people are the fire of jahannam are the people of the fire of jahannam it's not been made clear to you this verdict will come straight from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right or wrong this verdict will come straight from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this verdict can only come at the time of revelation at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because revelation was going on at that time after the demise of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam nobody is sending you down revelation or nobody is sending me revelation down nobody is telling me or nobody is telling you that that person heart is never going to change the knower of the heart allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does not send revelation down to you he does not send revelation down to me about the situation of the hearts of the people so you are this chapter has forever been closed so you are supposed to make dua for every single person whether he is a muslim or not muslim you are supposed to make dua for everyone if you don't trust me listen to the next ayat this ayat that i just recited verse number 113 recite the next verse verse 114 of surah tauba what it says wa ma kana sayfaru ibrahim al yabi same topic same thing that ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam he used to make dua for his own father every time day and night he is making dua for his own father until revelation came to him and allah told him to stop allah told him to stop and then he stopped otherwise he would keep on making dua for his own father he would carry on making dua for his own father he would never stop revelation came down and then allah told him to stop and then he stopped so for most of us who are sitting here especially this holds true for all of our you know relatives and friends who are alive those who are dead there is a different situation for them different circumstance different situation for them but those of our relatives who are alive who are still here who are alive they are supposed to be in your duas make dua for them make dua for your parents who are non muslims who are not muslims and even make dua for the parents who have who are far away from the deen of allah subhanahu wa taala you should make dua for them make dua for your siblings make dua for your friends you have to be engaged in making dua for all these people and this is a good reminder for myself and for you especially this time it's a good reminder for all of us because we are in the month of ramadan and we are making already we are making a lot of duas so make dua for your people make dua for your friends make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the guidance of your friends for the guidance of your family members ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them the best of this dunya and give them the best of the next life they give them the best of the hereafter and this is something that we need to understand you look at the translation of quran and i can fall into the same kind of mistake we all can fall into the same kind of mistake so it's important when you are understanding quran you are very very careful you are not supposed to make something halal that allah has made haram this is the deen of allah subhanahu wa taala this is not my deen this is not your deen this is the deen of allah subhanahu wa taala we should fear making something haram that allah has made halal and we should fear making something haram that allah has made halal you know let me tell you one more story and then i will finish there was this one sahabi and he had two pieces of cloth on upper piece of cloth and lower piece of cloth so he was wearing two pieces of cloth <coughs> 
What happened? He was about to make his salah. He was about to perform his salah. He took off his upper piece of cloth and he put it on a working stool. There was a working stool like, like lying right next to him. So he took off his upper piece of cloth and put it on that stool. And he has now his lower piece of cloth which is covering his satar which is covering the part of his body which is supposed to be covered during the time of Salah or in the time of Salah. That part of his body is covered. But he is only, only performing Salah in one piece of cloth. And where is his second piece of cloth? It's there, right next to him, lying on the working stool. It's right there. So he took off his upper piece of cloth, he has his lower piece of cloth on and he's making his Salah. There's another guy sitting here and he's not a Sahabi by the way. This guy who's performing Salah, he's a Sahabi. And the other guy who is sitting there and watching him, he's not a Sahabi. And he looks at him and he says to himself, what kind of guy he is? What kind of person he is? He has his upper piece of cloth, he takes it off and now he's praying his Salah. How can he pray his Salah, how can he pray his salah with just his lower piece of cloth on? How can he pray his Salah just in one piece of cloth? And it's not like he's deprived from the upper piece of cloth. It's still there. It's right there next to him. So why did he take it off and how are he praying his Salah? So when that Sahabi finished his Salah, that guy walked up to him and he said to him, you know, your namaz is not accepted. Your namaz is not valid. Because you had your upper piece of cloth, you had your upper piece of cloth, you took it off, it was right next to you and you were just praying your Salah in a lower piece of cloth. So he said, your namaz is not valid. And he is not a Sahabi and he's telling this to a Sahabi. Look at the situation. He's telling this, he said, your namaz is not valid. You know, this happened to all of us. We are in the masjid, alhamdulillah. And because it's, it's, it's the beauty of our religion that there are so many different, there are so many different school of thoughts. And there are so many differences of opinion. But let me finish that story and then I will come to that point. So he said, your namaz is not valid because you were just reading, you were just reading your salah in a lower piece of course. So your namaz is not valid. Even though his satr was covered. His satr was covered. So you know what that sahabi said to him? He said, I did it intentionally because I knew you were watching me. So I did it intentionally so that a stupid person like you so that a fool like you will understand that in the time of Rasulullah most of us, most of the companions of Rasulullah had just one piece of cloth and they used to pray their salah like this. I did it intentionally so that the stupid part, I knew you were watching me and I knew you were going to judge me. So I did it intentionally. So you would come to me and I would tell you this. I will tell you this. That's what we need to understand. When you look into the ayat, when you look into the hadith of Rasulullah it's important that we put all the ayat, all the hadith of Rasulullah into a context and then we derive conclusion. Only if we are qualified enough to do that. Only if we are qualified enough to do that. Alhamdulillah, the people here in Edinburgh, I have seen it in my masjid, I have seen it in, in, in this masjid as well. You will see that people, they are performing the same ibadat but in different manners. Now let me tell you one thing very, very clearly. I have said it so many times before. After the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there is not even a single occasion when all Sahaba agreed upon one single way in terms of legal matters, in terms of fiqhi matters, in terms of aqaid, in terms of belief. Alhamdulillah, they all are same according to every school of thought, according to all uh, imams or all different school of thoughts. But when it comes to legal matters, there have always been differences of opinions. But as long as these differences of opinion are within the premises of Sharia, Alhamdulillah, that's fine. You have no right to shove your opinion down to my throat, I have no right to shove my opinion down to your throat, especially in the month of Ramadan when some people are praying 8, some people are praying 20, some people are following the moon of Saudi Arabia, some people are following the moon of South Africa. So you know, there's, there's a lot of discussions going on, there's sometimes there, in, in our book, I can tell you from Ahnaf side because I know and I have studied the, the school of Ahnaf, so I know this very very clearly and I can tell you the quotations and I can show you the quotations and I can tell you the references. A book called Hidayah in Kitabu Salah it says that from Allahu Akbar until Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah there are more than 400 different ways in which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed his Salah. There are so many riwayat and if you calculate all those riwayat there are more than 400 different ways in which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed his Salah. You take any of that way any of the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and your salah will be accepted. One thing that we all agree upon is what? That we have to pray five times a day. So you pray five times a day in whatever way you want to pray. As long as it falls within the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, alhamdulillah it's okay. Alhamdulillah it's fine. And it's so sarcastic. You know, when it comes to this dunya, we always go to the experts. Every time we go to the experts. You know, when it comes to medicines, you go to doctors. You know, when it comes to buildings, you go to civil engineer. You know, when it comes to business, you go to businessman. 
Now when it comes to car, when it comes to your cars, you go to, to showrooms or you go to the people who are dealing with the cars. You know, but when it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't go to the experts. When it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everyone is expert other than the real expert. Everyone is expert. Or you know who is expert when it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know who is, who is the expert? It's, it's Sheikh Google. You know, last time I checked Sheikh Google, it was a search engine. It was not an expert. It was not something, someone who, who is expert in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that we need to understand. The reason I've chosen this ayah is to make all of you understand and to make myself understand reading the translation of Quran is not enough. We need to understand the context, we need to go to the experts, ask their opinion, <coughs> let us know that what is the context of that ayah and according to the context of that ayah, then inshallah we will be able to derive conclusions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide everyone and all of our beloved to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our du'as especially in the month of Ramadan and all of our ibadahs that we are performing in the month of Ramadan. Barakallahu.